Hello, and thanks for tuning in to another Fisher Investments Market Insights podcast, where we discuss our firm's latest thinking on global capital markets and current events. My name is Naj Srinivas. I'm the Group Vice President of Client Communications here at the firm. And today, Friday, September 20th, I'm joined by Seth Grainer, a research analyst here at the firm. Seth, thanks so much for joining us. Hello, everyone. Seth, you cover the United Kingdom, and Brexit has been obviously in the news for the last three years, three plus years, and it's been some time since we've actually checked in with you on Brexit, where we're at, and what our latest thinking is on it. And so let's start in on that topic. What's happened over the course of, say, the last two months with regard to Brexit? Has any progress been made? Well, unfortunately, probably not a whole lot progress has actually been made, Naj. But taking a step back, we go back a little bit further than a couple months ago. You may recall that in the early part of the summer, Theresa May, the former prime minister, decided to step down. It was clear that uh, her original vision for Brexit was not able to pass parliament. And so as a result, she decided uh, maybe a new leadership team would allow to break the impasse within parliament. And so over the summer, we saw a election for a new prime minister. Now, UK elections, not to get too wonky and into the weeds, uh, in this situation, a general election or the full electorate was not required to elect a new prime minister. The Conservative Party, through their coalition with the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland, still retained a majority government. And so all they really needed to do was find a new prime minister. And as, as listeners probably are well aware, that new leader turned out to be Boris Johnson. Former mayor of London, right? Former mayor of London, indeed. And so maybe back to your original comment, what's been accomplished since then or in the last couple months? Not a whole lot. We're still largely dealing with a substantially similar impasse within parliament and their inability to really agree at a sort of aggregate level what the right choice is going forward. So right now, the next step is final steps. If you believe that the deadline will indeed hold, there's an EU summit, a summit with a larger European Union uh, later in the month of October 18th, I believe is the last day of the summit. And if there is a deal, well, the UK will leave with a deal on the deadline, which is currently October 31st. I like to call it the spooky Brexit. <laughs> But if indeed there's no deal passed, Parliament has said that Boris Johnson, as the new prime minister, under law now, should ask the EU for an extension for the Brexit date to January 2020. Kicking the can a little bit further. At least for a few months. So as I understand it, Parliament is on a bit of a break right now. Can you help explain to our listeners what's going on there? Because it's kind of a unique situation. Yeah, it definitely is. So you're exactly right. The uh, UK Parliament is on a break. Uh, They've been effectively suspended, more accurately, by the Prime Minister. So when Boris Johnson uh, was elected, he decided that they should take a break here in late September through the middle of October. Now, it's been somewhat controversial, of course. A suspension to end one session of Parliament and start a new one is not uncommon at all, Uh, particularly when a new prime minister is taking over. There's essentially some sense that that something like that might occur. Um, The length of this has been part of the concern, and, of course, the bigger concern would be the timing of it, occurring during a very critical moment in, really, UK negotiations with the EU related to Brexit, Suspension of Parliament and giving Parliament and really having no say or at least quieting them for the time time period uh, of critical negotiations was seen somewhat as controversial as it suggested the Prime Minister was working very much towards a no-deal Brexit for October 31st, which he had been, at least rhetorically speaking, being pursuing uh, uh, since becoming prime minister and even during the leadership race over the summer. So as we approach that end of October, the Halloween Brexit, or would you call it the spooky Brexit? Spooky Brexit. What are the probabilities that we get an extension or 
Prime Minister Boris Johnson continues to barrel forward towards a no-deal Brexit. Well, I'm not sure that we at here, here at Fisher Investments would put you know strong probabilities beyond those individual uh, aspects as you've described them. Um, certainly, each of them are uh, uh, possible in some senses. You know, there's there's four real primary possibilities in all of this. One, they can indeed have a no deal Brexit. However, I hinted at the fact earlier in conversation that Parliament has passed a law requiring the Prime Minister to ask for a further extension. So that suggests that the no deal scenario on October 31st, while still possible, is probably a lower probability. What's probably a greater chance of happening, and again, not to get too fine in the details of percentages around these possibilities, a greater possibility is one of two things. One, an extension, since it doesn't appear on the surface that the two parties will be able to find a, an amicable re resolution. And because there's a law on the book books requiring the prime minister to ask for an extension, there's a very good chance that that comes to fruition and you get an extension through the first month of 2020. I think a decent chance, and one maybe underappreciated by some participants or some onlookers, is actually that a deal gets done. Remember that a primary opposition of the original deal with the EU under Prime Minister Theresa May was related to the Irish backstop. And while it's not easily solved under the new uh, government and Boris Johnson, of course, um, there's not necessarily any unique ideas being bandied about. There is some compromise potentially showing signs uh, that the UK government could accept some form of quote-unquote backstop, but not quite as harsh as the one that was originally perceived. There's also some consideration from the EU side, on the European Union side, uh, that they may be able to willing, may be willing to give a little bit on this front. They still have some red lines, and there's no obvious solution in sight, but certainly a deal is not off the table before October 31st. Seth, so you said some progress has been made on the Irish backstop. Can you share some more detail on that? Yeah. So this week, we actually started to see uh, negotiators between the UK and the EU express some middle ground or some potential creative solutions to solving the Irish border, uh, Irish backstop conundrum. And specifically, the UK has presented what seems to be amounting to some sort of special economic zone, considering the Northern Ireland uh, economy and country to be some sort of special entity within the broader United Kingdom, one that would follow the rules of the United, excuse me, of the EU and Irish economy, being a member of the EU, to ensure seamless trade and travel and other sort of regulatory regimes. Now, the two parties are being creative here. There's certainly no sense that they've found a solution, but perhaps there's some sense that there's a, a germ of one, if you will, uh, as Mr. Johnson likes to, Prime Minister Johnson likes to refer to a germ of an idea in all of this to solving the conundrum. That's encouraging to see. And in fact, you've seen the pound rally in recent days on the news. Uh, the, the pound sterling had fallen close to uh, $1.19 versus the U.S. dollar and is back up to about $1.25, uh, which is a good sig signal, if you will, in all of this, that maybe something's moving in the right direction. I don't want to give listeners the wrong idea, but it's nice to see that progress and, the again, as uh, Prime Minister Johnson likes to suggest, a germ of an idea in all of that, perhaps coming to some resolution. So some creative thinking happening. Without question. Let's talk a little bit about Scotland, because there's been some talk about a Scottish referendum to actually stay in the European Union if the UK actually agrees to leave. What's the likelihood that we see something like that come to pass? Here again, in dealing with a bit of possibilities and probabilities, um, I think over the long run, Naj, to your sense, this has certainly been uh, um, somewhat distasteful for a lot of the Scottish um, voters, and more specifically those who have already sought independence. And it might be enough 
to rally, if you will, the electorate within Scotland to take another shot at independence. Um, it would not be taken very lightly, of course, and in many respects, Scotland having to become an independent member of the EU comes with it really a whole slew of additional effort, responsibilities, and tests. It wouldn't come quickly, nor do I think that a vote on independence would necessarily come very quickly either. So it definitely increases the chances, I think, this whole experience probably increases the chance that you at least have another chance for a referendum on independence from Scotland, but an actual successful vote for independence or a successful entry into the EU is probably quite a bit further out. So throughout all of this, since 2016, April 2016, I think it was, how has the UK and EU economy been doing? Sure. Generally speaking, probably a little better than most listeners might expect. In the EU, we've got something like 25, 26 quarters of positive GDP growth. And that was definitely true within the UK as well, until here the last quarter. Q2 GDP in, in uh, uh, the United Kingdom was actually negative for the first time uh, since the referendum and really since uh, 2012, if memory serves me. So quite a while. The primary driver of that weaker quarter, though, was a little bit more technical in nature. If you think about the original Brexit deadline, it happened to line up with Q1 end in 2019, March 31st, essentially March 30th, 2019. And so in advance, companies and consumers did a lot of stockpiling. That boosted somewhat unnaturally and temporarily GDP in Q1. And because of the nature of GDP accounting, the quarter over quarter, the second quarter in this scenario, the uh, through June 2019, was actually a little bit weaker. Why? Because all that activity in the first quarter was kind of pulled forward from that second quarter. And so the second quarter, you saw actually a negative GDP print. I don't think investors should get overly concerned about that particular scenario or to suggest that there's been a significant deterioration of economic activity in the United Kingdom. It's more technical in nature and likely unlikely to be sustained or exacerbated. Now, at the same time, if you did have a no-deal scenario on October 31st, you could very well see, most market market participants might suggest you might see a temporary recession, but here again, not get overly concerned because we think that it'll ultimately be temporary in nature. A no-deal scenario isn't particularly ideal in any way, shape, or form, uh, and certainly by a macroeconomic factor, probably not the best outcome, certainly not over the short run. Over the long run, we're probably a little more sanguine about the situation. Haven't most businesses in the UK that might be impacted by a hard Brexit already adjusted and accounted for this possibility? I think the degree to which they possibly can, yes. Uh, And I think there's certainly some sense that companies have done their absolute best. Unfortunately, it's a scenario in which you can't really test that plan until it happens. And so to your point, while a large percentage or the vast majority of them perhaps have taken some steps or planning, it really would remain to be seen whether or not that planning is ultimately effective in averting a sort of more significant situation. For the most part, though, you can fully expect that large corporations, perhaps the largest portions of the economy, uh, are in a reasonably well position. I think the hardest challenge is going to be for those mom and pop kind of export import companies, those that rely uh, on goods and services from the EU that are a little more local in nature. That might be a little bit more painful relative to those large multinational conglomerates. Seth, anything else you want to share with our listeners? Well, you know, I think, Naj, we'd probably just recommend that listeners take everything we've said today with a bit of a grain of salt. Ultimately, these things are changing day by day. And even in the next two weeks, you've got what they refer to in the UK as conference season. So all the major parties are going back having their conferences, coming up with their new ideas, and you can sure bet that Brexit's going to be the topic 
uh, most talk about. And we'll see whether or not the major parties, labor or the conservatives, come up with some creative solutions, some new ideas that really inflect or change this direction yet again. Certainly the uh, answers aren't all before us, and we might see some more volatility over the next two weeks as a result of that conference season. Seth, thanks so much. That's unfortunately all we have time for today. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. For more, please visit marketminder.com. Investing in securities involves the risk of loss. Past performance is no guarantee of future returns. The content of this podcast represents the opinions and viewpoints of Fisher Investments and should not be regarded as personal investment advice. No assurances are made we will continue to hold these views, which may change at any time based on new information, analysis, or reconsideration. Copyright Fisher Investments 2019.